you all for being here today. It's, uh, it's great to see you, uh, all your faces, and uh, I'm glad that you, you could uh, come today. Um, I, I can't help but remarking that we are living in such extraordinary times. Um, and I know it's a time for many of us to uh, that feel a lot of anxiety, a lot of concern. Um, and so uh, I think we're here at the right place, uh, a place of meditation. Uh, so before we even begin, what I would like us to do is just to take a moment, not to meditate, but just, just relax. I'd like us just for a couple of minutes before we begin to just relax. If you feel any tenseness in your body, if you could go to that place and pay attention to it, see if it can be relaxed a little bit more. If you are experiencing a mind that seems to be a little bit tight, See if you can relax that for just a moment. I've got two short assignments for you. The first one is I'd like for you to establish in your own mind what your motivation and your specific intent is in being in this space right now. What is your motivation? And what is your intent? And firmly establish that motivation, uh, that intent in your own mind. <clears throat> Now I'm going to ask you a second question. And the second question is, what do you want to get out of the next two hours? What are you, what are you looking for in the next two hours? This last question we'll come back to in just a minute. <laughs> so again, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Broadwater. I'm the Associate uh, Lama at uh, Columbus KTC. Uh, I'm broadcasting here from Zanesville, Ohio, which is about 60 miles from Columbus. It's a beautiful day here. Uh, the sun's shining. I hope the same applies in your area. Uh, so this morning, uh, the topic is freedom through meditation. Now, ideally, if you're going to have a meditation instructor, you want someone that uh, has a great deal of experience and uh, realization. But I have no special 
experience, and I certainly don't have any realization. When I wake up in the morning, I make my tea or coffee. Then I head into this room and study and meditate for a period of time. And the, uh, I follow the same procedure in the evening. So I, I'm no different than any of you that are uh, listening to my voice right now. I will say, however, that my self-isolation for the past year has allowed me a bit more time to meditate. Uh, and since I'm not so busy, it's, uh, it's allowed me to be a little bit more mindful and aware in my um, off cushion activities. But um, there's nothing extraordinary about uh, either my experience and uh, certainly I had no realization. But what I was thinking about this morning is that while you and I may not be great meditators, uh, we have extraordinary opportunities never in the history, uh, uh, ever in history, uh, to, to get uh, a vantage of, to have access to some of the greatest meditators uh, in the world. Uh, we have that access through the internet. There's often uh, programs such as this by great meditators that we have access to. We certainly have uh, any number of great books to, uh, to look at and to read and to, uh, to contemplate. So we're really fortunate in that respect. Uh, so uh, why I'm telling you all this is because that whatever I'm saying today, it will be from one of the great meditators of the present or the past, uh, His Holiness uh, the 17th Karmapa, uh, Tranga Rinpoche, um, uh, Gompopa, uh, uh, Kempo Karta Rinpoche. So anything that's good about what I say here today, if you find something helpful, I can assure you it is from one of these, one of these people. Uh, I decided to break the sessions up uh, instead of in half hour uh, meditation sessions, which I thought would be a little bit too long. Uh, we're going to do it uh, um, no more than 10 or 15 minutes, depending upon how, uh, the, how time works out. Uh, and we'll, we'll go along, we'll see that. At one point, we'll take a 10 minute tea and uh, uh, potty break, uh, where that will be, I'm not quite sure yet. Depends on how uh, how uh, how things work out. But at some point, we'll take a uh, a short break. And I'll be somewhere in the middle. Uh, my hope is that everyone can stay to the end. We're, we will end promptly at twelve. Uh, and the reason I I would uh, request you all stay until the end. Uh, it's what my uh, teacher, Kimbo Carter Rinpoche, once said to me. He said, if you begin a Dharma activity, complete it. Uh, don't stop halfway through. And he, he said that because, well, he told us later, he said that if we, if we stop in the middle of an activity and don't finish it, we're really creating um, a habit of not finishing uh, something important. So uh, if you can, if you are able, uh, please stay until 12. If you cannot, I understand that there'll be no problem. And since this is going to be recorded, you could pick it up later. But before we go into our first meditation session, I'd like to ask you all, uh, what would you like to get out of this uh, uh, out of the, the next two hours. And, um, and so I'll just open that up. Uh, anyone who would like to, uh, to open up, up the discussion, I'd love to hear from you. Just what is it that you would like to hear? What is it that you would like 
to um, know more about anything along those lines. And just uh, first come, first serve. Well, hi, I'm Stephanie Collins. Uh, I've seen you at hi, the Stephanie. Columbus KTC a long time ago, many years ago. Um, but I'm hoping I haven't been meditating and I always kind of had this idea that it was something I couldn't do. And oh. I had this, I think maybe because my first, you know, I just felt like I had to sit in a proper position and Daryl Peters, you know, um, helped me, you know, quite a bit. Um, but I think that I took a, some time away and just lived a life and have come back to the Buddhist studies, but I've uh, realized that meditation would really help me to be able to listen to spiritual uh, guidance and inspiration from bodhisattvas. And I really want to open my heart in my mind mm -hmm. to, to hear, to, to listen to, instead of to, to create a space, to hear what other, what, you know, what, what I've been asking to hear, because I wasn't always listening. So I'm hoping to clear the block that I have about meditation so that I can listen better. Ah, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And uh, well, yeah, and welcome back. And Thank you, you had what? <laughs> And you had a you had a great teacher uh, uh, in uh, in Daryl. He was a, he's a wonderful teacher. So uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so don't worry so much about uh, technique and that sort of thing. What I will do at the very beginning, I will review technique uh, for you so that uh, it that will be a little bit easier. Uh, but. Uh, Great, I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you're you back and uh, hopefully we can be of some help. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm looking to a refueling. Good. Anybody else? Just unmute yourself. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Lama Tom, and I was looking forward to community. I've been doing a lot of meditation oh. on my own, starting Nindro, so I'm you know, like up to here in prostrations, but <laughs> I, I so appreciate um, community, so that was why I wanted to come today. Yeah, there is something about uh, doing meditation together that seems far more powerful um, and just having it you know I, I will later on say in my talk about uh, there is uh, not a great deal of support out there in the in the world for meditators and so we need one another um, for that support and so I'm glad uh, I'm glad you're here Justin and uh, Congratulations on doing Nundro. That's a that's a heavy undertaking, and uh, hang in there, keep keep it up. No expectations, just open mind and heart. Wonderful, thank you, Marilyn. That was you. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Rachel, and uh, hi Rachel. I I was really excited to sign up for this workshop for a few reasons. Primarily though, um, I just moved to the Columbus area. So I'm trying to reach out and uh, find some kind of like Justin, you know, it's like, I'm ready to, to, to create a community around myself. And also because of the way um, the past year has oh, kind of unfolded for me, I've, um, I've strayed a little bit from my from my path from my meditation path and I just feel like maybe if I just jump right into a workshop to our workshop that maybe that'll kind of help me wonderful we said I see the nodding heads and that gives me encouragement <laughs> <laughs> good 
Good, that's wonderful. Uh, Rachel, uh, this is not uncommon as you, you see with the nodding heads that uh, it, it, takes, it takes effort to reestablish a, a pattern of meditation. And it takes a, a certain amount of courage to do that, to, to start again. Um, and it certainly takes courage to, uh, to um, say that for, to all of us. And so thank you very much for sharing that. Anyone else? Mama Tom, there's a new comment in the chat from Jeff. Okay, could you read it for me? Yes, of course. Um, some insight into what is meant by observing my mind stream. Ah, okay. Yeah, so uh, was that Jeff, you say? Well, Jeff, I think, hi, Jeff. Uh, I think in the course of uh, meditation, uh, this is something you, you, you Hopefully it's something that we will experience, but if it's not something that is, um, that becomes apparent to you, at the end we'll have time for more questions and I'll, 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 I'll ask you then again, does that make sense to you? Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Open mind and heart. Okay, good. That's a, that's a very good uh, way to, a good attitude to have uh, beginning any Dharma activity, to have an open mind and an open heart. That's really, uh, that's really cool. Thank you. All right. So we'll have our first session uh, right here uh, now. And uh, since there are some of you that uh, need a review, I'll, I'll try to be clear in my instructions and uh, helpful in uh, how I say, uh, give you the instructions. First of all, there's, um, there's three aspects, our motivation, our physical posture, our mental technique, and, and aside what we do when our mind wanders. So those are the three things we'll uh, look at. So the first thing is our physical posture. And uh, the most important thing is to have a stable seat, sitting stably. Uh, some folks uh, put their uh, legs in a uh, Vajra position, something like this, or one uh, leg out in front of the other. Uh, and if you're sitting in a chair, uh, the importance there is keep your back straight away from the back of the chair and your feet firmly planted on the ground. There is a process called drawing up, which is basically tightening up the sphincter muscles, nice and tight, sort of drawing in, and then allowing uh, those muscles to relax. As far as the hands are concerned, uh, you can put them in the uh, posture of equipoise, or you can drape them over your knees. It's uh, whichever seems more comfortable for you. For me, it seems more comfortable to drape them over my knees. Again, the back nice and straight. That's real. That probably of all the instructions I give in this respect, that's probably the most important that we keep our backs nice and straight. Our chin slightly tucked in, our tongue up against the roof of our mouth towards. Uh, our, uh, our front teeth, you know, up and towards the front of our teeth. Our gaze is slightly off the end of our nose and it's a soft gaze. It's not that you're staring at anything in particular. People ask, do I have to keep my eyes open? And the answer is no. But generally speaking, um, well, I, I speak from my own experience. 
if I close my eyes, I tend to get uh, get a little lazy and uh, may even fall asleep. So my advice is keep the eyes open in a soft gaze. Uh, the mental technique is basically pay attention to your breath. Uh, a lot of times people uh, pay attention at the right below the nose where, uh, where the air comes in and out, where the breath comes in and out. That's where we're placing our attention. Some people like to observe the breath going all the way out and coming all the way in and going into the stomach like that, that's okay. The importance is, and the instruction is, place your attention on your breath. Some people count breaths up to 21. I don't, and I wouldn't recommend it. Just pay attention to the breath. Now, when our minds pay attention to the breath, there's going to be, it, it, it will wander from time to time. That's not a problem. That's not a problem. When the mind wanders, simply notice that it has wandered. You may want to label it, hey, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. So I come back. I come back to my breath. Gently come back to your breath. Don't beat yourself up because you, your mind has wandered. Just simply note that and return your attention to the breath. So again, think of your motivation. Your motivation is wanting uh, to meditate. That's the most basic. There may be additional elements to your motivation, but your most basic one is that you want to meditate. You pay attention to your posture in the manner that I've explained. And you observe the mental technique of placing your attention on your breath in and out. And so uh, we'll do this meditation practice um, for the next uh, 15 minutes.
If right now, for any reason, you're having difficulty meditating, that's really not a problem. Just relax. Don't try to meditate, just relax. And then when you've regained your resources, regained your composure, then return to, uh, to the technique. But for the moment, if you're having difficulty, just relax. Return when you're ready. So again, if you're having difficulty maintaining your attention on your breath, just relax. It's far better to have good short sessions of meditation than one long, difficult, um, uptight kind of situation. So. If you're having difficulty, it's okay to relax and return to the meditation when you're ready.
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'll give my first short talk here. The, uh, the title of this uh, retreat was uh, Liberation Through Meditation. <laughs> the first question is, what are we being liberated from? What do we want to be liberated from? Um, that's, a, that's a good first question, right? What are we seeking liberation from? In a way, it's sort of, that's sort of a silly question when we just look around us. I mean, here we are in one of the worst pandemics our country and the world has ever faced. We're in one of the worst political crises our country has ever endured. What do we want to be liberated from? We want to be liberated from a dreaded plague. We want a resolution from the extreme political instability that is currently manifest. We're all, you and I, all of us are united in those concerns. We all have those thoughts uh, as we come here today. And certainly while these situations seem to have arisen more fiercely in the last couple of days, the number of deaths have certainly increased and the instability seems to keep, uh, keep growing. Even though those situations are fiercely manifesting, actually they've been in process for quite some time. But maybe you like me, were, I was a little surprised at how they sort of exploded in the last few days. I'm sure what I'm thinking and saying uh, is reflected in your own hearts and minds. On reflection, however, we shouldn't be surprised. The Buddha told us that suffering is a part of samsaric existence. Suffering is not coincidental, it is inherent in our lives. It's part and parcel of being alive. His Holiness, the 17th Karmapa, and his teaching on the uh, four, uh, four dharmas of Gampopa, he had some really incisive things to say about suffering. And much of this talk is now basically from my notes that I took from listening to him. First of all, suffering can be divided and it's traditionally divided into three categories. There is the suffering of suffering. We all know this kind of suffering. It's the pains of birth, old age, sickness, and death. I don't think it's any accident that babies and mothers uh, aren't smiling at the point of birth. There's pain involved in birth. There's pain involved in old age. I know, it takes a great deal of patience sometimes. Sickness, we, we, we're experiencing the horror of this plague. And there's all this certainty, uncertainty about it. And there's also the suffering of death. It's not only about its certainty that it's going to happen, but rather the unpredictability of it. 
you know, I'd like to live maybe 10 more productive years in my life. I'd like that. But there is absolutely no guarantee that is so. I could walk out of my house tomorrow and be run over by a car. And the same for you. And it's that uncertainty, that unpredictability, I should say, the unpredictability of it that is concerning. Certainly, we know we're going to die. Then there's the suffering of change. It's like when you get what you want, you know you can't hold on to it. Even if things are great right now for you, it's only a matter of time. You could be the most powerful, most wealthy, most proud person in the world. And eventually, you're going to lose it all. That's the suffering of change. Then there's all pervasive change. Normally, this suffering is something that goes unnoticed. But it's in our daily lives. And if we did notice it a bit more, uh, it would be very instructive. To explain this, Karmapa said, our world is really like a prison. That may sound a little dramatic, you know? That sounds a little dramatic. But there's truth in that observation. The only difference between a state penitentiary and our world is the difference of how, how much space we have. We have a lot more space than inmates to a state penitentiary. So it's the size of our prison. We live in a bigger prison. So what we can want, what we can aspire to, what we wish to accomplish is limited. It's bounded. It's finite. But our desires, our ambitions, our hopes are unbounded. They're infinite. but they are all bounded by what the Karmapa calls prison walls. In this situation, we may feel like there's no way out, no way out from our suffering, that we are prisoners simply with rules that we have to follow. Interesting in this situation, sometimes we actually think that it's not really all so bad, that we're sort of, well, you know, things are going okay. But in fact, that's simply because in our temporarily good situation, we have grown used to our prison walls. Nonetheless, in the end, we are in prison. We have no control. And it seems like somebody else has control. This is samsara. So who or what keeps us in this state? It's our karma and our afflictive emotions. Karma and our afflictive emotions. We have lost control and all of our freedom to karma and the afflictions. Sounds like a rock band, doesn't it? <laughs> karma and the afflictions. <laughs> but that's it. We've lost control to that rock band. We're sort of like a dog on a leash. 
We have to go where karma and the afflictions lead us. When we experience this kind of confinement, this kind of control, we often seek a way out that's not really that helpful. At best, it's temporary. We may see, you know, drinking, drugs, fixation on sex, different entertainments and so forth. And that's certainly proliferated during this time of epidemic. We've sought some way out that's temporary. I'm not, I'm not uh, disputing the fact that uh, those are sometimes helpful, but as a permanent solution to our situation, it's not. Because after the diversion is over or the hangover is over, we're back where we started from. So how do we actually gain freedom from samsara? First of all, <laughs> samsara is not a place. And I'll explain that in this way. You could fly off into space to the very ends of the universe and you'd still be suffering. Samsara is not a place. Rather, our suffering is related to our state of mind. So we need to understand this at a very deep and profound level. Our suffering is related to our mind. And also the problem here is sometimes we don't realize how profound our suffering is because we've never been freed from karma and the afflictions. We've never had the experience of not being led by our karma and by our afflictions. We have nothing to compare it to. We have no idea what freedom might mean. But we can understand that freedom from them will result in our liberation and our happiness. So the main point is that it all comes down to our mind. And so we need to train our minds, improve our minds. Our ultimate freedom depends upon improved and trained minds. So let's take uh, five minutes. And if you need a little bit longer, okay. Well, actually, let's go until five after 11. You can get your tea. Uh, if you need to do a potty break or something of that sort, you can do that too. Uh, and then we'll return at promptly at uh, five after.
Okay, if we could return. During the break, I had this thought. And uh, the thought I had was, I wish I could tell you that all this difficulties that we are experiencing in terms of the political situation and in terms of <clears throat> this uh, disease is going to be cleared up quickly. I'd like to be able to tell you that, but I can't tell you that, I don't know. But what I hope, and this is the good part, what I hope is that we develop the tools that no matter what happens, nothing will overwhelm us. That we'll be able to deal with it clearly and with a stable mind. And we can develop those faculties, those qualities of the mind of stability and clarity through meditation. So the bad news is I can't tell you things are going to get better immediately. There does look like some things on the horizon that are hopeful, but I don't know. The more important thing is, no matter what, my wish for you, my hope for you is that um, you develop the skills and uh, the strength of mind through meditation that nothing becomes overwhelming for you. And I think that's, that's possible. That's definitely possible. Okay, so uh, let's do, uh, let's do 10 minutes of meditation. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll get back at uh, 17 after the hour. Following the instructions I have given you, uh, let's for 10 minutes meditate.
I forgot to mute myself and you may have heard a clock ticking in the background. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, so we've talked about karma and the afflictions and we talked about it's all within our mind. And we've talked about the fact that because of that, we want to improve and train our mind. And the chief manner in which we do that is through meditation. I'd like to go to something else that the Karmapa has said yeah, in his book, Freedom uh, Through Meditation. Yeah, I stole the title for, for, the, for this uh, talk uh, from the Karmapa. In his book, Freedom from Meditation, which is a great book, he said that we really have to examine our motivation when we're, when we're meditating. Because a good motivation creates a clear and transparent environment for our minds. So we start out, why am I meditating? And that creates a whole environment that's transparent. I'm telling myself why I'm doing this. <clears throat> <clears throat> the other thing I want to tell you is that techniques in meditation are important, but we don't want to focus too much on them. We can do that. We can get too sort of crazy about our technique. Somebody else was asking about that earlier, I think. Let's not get crazy about it. Uh, the bigger picture is the mental landscape we're creating. Uh, that's more important. And it's the basic attitude we bring to meditation that's far more important than any technique. And here's the deal. The most important point of meditation is learning how to relax the mind within the mind itself. That's the most important thing. Learning how to let go is the most central point. Learning to let go. We come into the meditation room where there's all kinds of identities. I'm a teacher, I'm a social worker, I'm a retired person, I'm this, I'm that. Let go of all of that. Let go of all of those identities. Just let go. And part of your worries are let go too because our identities are very much uh, wrapped up into our anxieties. The main instruction is to allow your mind to rest one pointedly on an object. We concentrate our energy and I, I'll get, that's a little worrisome in terms of a word to use, concentrate, but I'm gonna use it because the Kamapa uses it. We concentrate our energy of the mind and direct it in a focused way. The analogy that the Kamapa uses is water being poured into a tube. We put all of our energy and put it like directed through a tube to whatever the focal point of our meditation might be. But, and here's the, here's the key point is, we do it in a relaxed way. Focused, but relaxed. One pointed, but relaxed. And that focal point can either be your breath or uh, something internal or something external. That's less important. Generally, we use the breath and we use the breath because it's with us. It's simple, it's uncomplicated. It's not something you have to think about so much. It's just there, sort of a nice support for our meditation. And it's convenient. The instructions are further that we involve our minds with 100% effort. Our minds are not here or there or someplace else. They're 100% here. That's the instruction. And of course, 
when, when that doesn't happen, that's not a problem. We just notice it and, and put that effort in. And as I said before, and I was talking to uh, in the very beginning, uh, sometimes we'll fall out of meditation. Sometimes, uh, quite honestly, we'll be in revelry. No problem, just bring our mind back. And another thing is sometimes we just find it after a, a certain amount of time of struggle, we're just not making it with the, with the technique. That's no problem, just relax. And when you're ready, come back. It's, as I said before, it's far better to do small little sessions than one major disaster. <laughs> That's not, that's not helpful in doing meditation. Small sessions. They may be over the course of 15 minutes, you may do five or six sessions because you've had to drop out. And that's, that, that's a problem particularly of um, the beginner, but it's also a problem for us uh, veteran meditators, particularly when we're, our minds are agitated for whatever reason and it's hard to relax, we just do small sessions. Another instruction is to experience the mind as light, not heavy. We can get sort of crazy about this, you know, try to be light about it. And when you, when you feel your, yourself getting heavy, try to experience the breath and your mind uh, coincidental with your breath as being light and fluid. That's another instruction. And I'm going to tell you one other thing, a little secret here. <laughs> it's not such a secret. Everybody knows that sometimes meditation is just downright boring. It's boring sometimes. Our mind is like a child who needs a lot of entertainment. I have a granddaughter. She calls me every night to read me a story. But the time she's finished her story, she's standing on her head or doing cartwheels, reading the book in her hand. And children like diversion. And our minds are like that. And so we have to be aware of that tendency to need distraction that we, uh, we, we don't, we crave attention and we don't like boredom. And the, and the way we remedy that is start off with a strong intention that no matter what, you're going to persevere. Make that your strong, you have that power within your mind to establish that sort of intention. That's a power you have, establishing your attention. And one of the things, I, this is basically not from the Kamapa, but just from my experiences, watch out for reverie, you know, where you go off and you have these nice, pleasant thoughts about this, that, or the other thing, and you think that's meditation, and you sort of fool yourself, well, it's a good thought, so what the heck, I might as well continue with it. I like it. It's fun. Reverie is not meditation. Uh, do that at another time. <laughs> We can fall in that habit too, quite easily. But I think if you follow these kind of instructions, it is inevitable that you will make progress as you go along. Now let's talk about the last challenge and we've already spoken about it a bit already. And that challenge is that the world does not support meditation. The world we live in is a world of the five senses the sensual aspects to consciousness, you know, uh, tasting, touching, feeling, smelling, seeing, all those things. It's a sensual world we live in. And meditation involves the sixth consciousness, the mental consciousness, that part of our mind um, that thinks and, and so forth. 
it does, it's not supported by the world outside. Very few worldly supporters. And so <clears throat> that's a challenge for us. So my, and I think somebody else mentioned this, they needed a group. My suggestion is you find a group that helps you. Uh, by the way, and I'll put a plug in for it, there is a group meeting every Wednesday you can find uh, on the KTD, uh, KTC site, Columbus KTC site that meets every Wednesday. Eric Weinberg is in charge of that group. And cer you're certainly, and I'm sure he would welcome you to that group. We need supporters. We need people that support us in our meditation. So we're, I'm, I'm sorry, we're sort of running out of time here. Uh, I didn't time myself appropriately. So we'll only do uh, five minutes of meditation now uh, instead of what I'd planned before. We'll do five minutes and we'll do it based on the instructions which I gave you, which in brief is better many short sessions if that's what you need to do. Be relaxed. Resting the mind within the mind, place the mind 100% on the focus of your attention. Keep the mind light, not heavy, and let go of all your concerns. So let's meditate for five minutes.
again, thank you for your practice. So the, the uh, next talk that I'm going to give comes directly from the Jewel Ornament of Liberation, Gampopa uh, is the author, and uh, commentated by uh, Trangu Rinpoche. So uh, in our desire for liberation, we travel the path of meditation. And the afflictions in our mind are causing us problems. We may find that our minds are highly agitated and unstable. And so meditation is there to help stabilize us and stabilize us <clears throat> so that we can see clearly. So the first thing is to stabilize our mind. And then we were able to see reality as it really is. That's the progression of meditation. By the way, I told you earlier, you know, sometimes meditation is, is uh, boring, but it also has its pleasures. Um, and one of its pleasures is eventually it helps us to develop this clear and stable mind. And that's the, again, that's the objective of meditation. And if we can see clearly, we can abandon these afflictions. We can abandon our karma if we can see clearly. So the direction we're going in with our meditation is stability and a clear mind. Another way of putting this is meditative concentration. And that's a word that Gompopa uses. Meditative concentration is simply the ability that we have, the ability to control the mind and have power over our mind to do what we, uh, whatever we need to do with that mind. Very simple uh, description of meditative concentration. But, and there's a but here, but we know we often lose control of our mind. And if we lose control of our mind, we lose control of our body. And if we lose control of our body, we, can, we lose control of our actions. And if we lose control of our actions, we, we, we lose control of our fate. It's sort of a domino effect. So this, this stability and clarity are central to the path. Getting more to the point, an angry mind is not stable or clear. A jealous mind is not stable or clear. Uh, a mind full of... Uh, desire and attachment, it's not clear, it's not stable. And certainly an ignorant mind, and we've seen, I won't go there. An ignorant mind is not stable, it's not clear. So simultaneously to our meditation practice, we have to practice virtue, the six virtues, the six paramitas, they're called in the Mahayana uh, vehicle. The six virtuous behaviors. And you probably already know them. Generosity, ethics, patience, diligence, meditative concentration, and wisdom awareness. You probably have heard of those before. So unlike those who try to monetize, make money out of meditation, when you do that, you learn that you, you, you lose this quality that is uh, an ethical dimension, a philosophical dimension, a practical, virtuous uh, dimension to meditation. These, these virtues are necessary in order to have a stable and a clear mind. 
also as practi practitioners of the Mahayana, our, our motivation and practice is to seek liberation, not only of ourselves, but all beings. So it's imperative for us to develop a, a, the practice of loving kindness and compassion to undergird this commitment to, to be a, a benefit to all beings. It's really important. So there's a practice called Tong Lin. Many of you have heard of it. Uh, very simply, it is giving and receiving. Um, uh, and uh, we'll do a short practice of that. Uh, and I find the instructions for that on page 118 of Dharma Paths. I'm just going to read the instructions that uh, Kempo Karthi Rinpoche gives us for it, and then we'll do it for a few moments. <clears throat> when you do this short meditation, first sit in meditative posture, relaxing your body and sitting rather comfortably. Then breathe normally, following the natural course of your breath. Imagine that the exhalation of your breath, <clears throat> whatever with the exhalation of the breath, whatever merit you have accumulated from beginningless time and are accumulating now and will accumulate in the future radiates towards all beings. Just as when the sun shines, it's rays of light that radiate toward all places. So with your exhalation, these positive qualities radiate bringing happiness and well-being and comfort, health and longevity to all beings. Then when you inhale, imagine you are inhaling all the suffering, confusion, sickness, turmoil, and conflict of sentient beings. All the suffering and turmoil of sentient beings merges with you. And this uproots the suffering and confusion of all sentient beings. <clears throat> now, here's the important point. Because of the strength of your bodhicitta, your mind of awakening, because of that strength, this, all these things that you're inhaling dissipate. They disappear. It's just as if you had collected some dust together into a little pile and a strong wind blew it away. Inhaling and exhaling, in this way, meditate for a short while. So, inhaling the suffering, exhaling goodness, kindness, love, all the merit that you've ever accumulated, ever will, or ever have, and are right now. Let's do this for two minutes. Inhaling the suffering of the world. Exhaling love, compassion, all the things that the world needs in the form of bright light. Now I want to give you some very simple instructions. Let go of all mental focus. Let your mind rest in a state of bare awareness. Try to have the sense that there is no being meditating, 
no being to meditate upon and no act of meditation. Try to transcend these three things. Just relax. Give birth to something ultimate, something effortless, spontaneous, like the arising and disappearing of clouds in the sky. There are different names for these practices, but they are called relative bodhicitta in the first case, or Tong Lin. And then in the second exercise of bare awareness, <clears throat> we're simulating ultimate bodhicitta. <coughs> it's uh, referred to as, <coughs> excuse me, It's referred to as a method in wisdom, uh, merit and wisdom also it's called. Both practices are very important to Dharma practitioners. Method means such as using Tonglin, giving and receiving, and simply bear awareness, being open. Those are two practices. Now, I'm going to end up the formal part of this talk with uh, a quote from Kempo Karta Rinpoche. Every time I read it, I sort of crack up because uh, my teacher, Kempo Karta Rinpoche, had so much confidence in our ability um, towards liberation. And he expressed that every time he saw us. He would ask us how we're doing, how's our practice going? And he was confident that we can make progress. So here's what he said. We must always be aware that at some point we will experience perfect liberation. At that point, nothing special or unique will come into being. No magical factor will be transmitted to us from the earth or from the heavens. It's just that we have the potential to awaken. And because we have met the proper skillful methods and have put in the necessary effort, we experience liberation. It is important to remember this because sometimes we lack confidence. We rely on some being or quality to come to us from the outside. And we think that if that outside person or quality does not come to us, we are helpless. In this way, we discourage ourselves, but the Buddhas who have realized the perfect state of liberation and are able to perform many kinds of immaculate, miraculous activities have experienced the full blossoming of certain seeds that, they, that are innate in them. Since these qualities are also innate in us, we must be confident in those qualities and our potential within our mind. 
liberation is possible. It's not impossible. So our path uh, that we've outlined for us today, uh, we go through loving kindness and compassion to the practice of virtue, the accumulation of merit, and through our meditative concentration, we develop stability, and with stability, we develop clarity. And with clear seeing, we develop ultimate bodhicitta, our goal of liberation. So we've got 10 minutes. And uh, why don't we, for, to begin with, why don't we start with any questions, concerns, or just responses, whatever comes to your mind that you would like to talk about for these uh, remaining moments, uh, I'd be glad to entertain them. Just unmute yourself and speak. Just responses, whatever comes to your mind that you would like to talk about for these uh, remaining moments, uh, I'd be glad to entertain. Just unmute yourself and speak. Rachel, I think you were trying to speak. Please go ahead if you would like. Lama Tom. Um, Lama Tom, can you hear me? This is Judy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you for this. It was very rich, and I appreciate your approach, which was light and enjoyable, but still there is a lot of um, a lot of really good information and um, um, so I really appreciate this, this event, this retreat, and appreciate what you've done with it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Rachel, for being here. Oh, it was Ju <laughs> Judy, did you have a question or a thought or a response? That was my comment. I just made that comment. Sorry. Okay, very good. Sorry for the confusion. Jeff, you had a, uh, a thought in the very beginning, and uh, was it, uh, was it, uh, did you get an answer as a result of the uh, meditation, or is there some more questions you have around your? Um, just more questions. Um um it'll be okay we'll just keep doing what i'm doing and it, i'll figure it out <laughs> it, it, certainly if you have questions that's uh, that's a good thing that's not a bad thing uh, i think it had something to do with mind stream or something of this sort yeah the question was observing the mind stream as you you know as is one practices and one uh, I'll just say lucky, um, you know, you get kind of into the sort of relaxed state where your mind is very calm. Um, you're still aware of things. Um, there are not a lot of distracting thoughts or whatever. And you're just, and one is just kind of, if you will, sitting there. And it seems like this is the time when one would be, um, quote unquote, observing one's mind stream, um, but maybe not. Um, and I was just kind of curious as to like, was there something I should look for or should I just sort of hang back and see what I see <laughs> or, um, or, you know, or what, you know, or, you know, yeah. this is just kind of, you know, and it's, 
you know, kind of a pleasant place to hang out, if you will, um, because yeah. things are very calm. But um, but at the same time, you know, I don't want to be missing an opportunity just because I'm kind of, you know, if you will, kicking my mental feet back and just being where I am. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question exactly. I'm going to try, though. This whole um, meditation that we're doing is not conceptual. It's not like I, I'm trying to think uh, that I'm going to put my attention on my mind stream. It's, it's not that conceptual. It's just relaxing. And, and, and as you said, observing, being awake, being mindful when your mind strays. But, but there's nothing conceptual about this. There are, and we did a, uh, a conceptual kind of meditation when we did Tong Lin. Mm -hmm. that, was con that was conceptual. But we're not doing any kind of conceptual thing at this point. There are other uh, there's uh, insight meditation where we actually do become very um, uh, conceptual, but this is not it. It is just, as you said, relaxing, observing, and not trying to label it. Okay, that's um, that that does answer the question, you know, because that's that's kind of what I thought, but at the same, you know, that I wasn't supposed to involve any sort of additional mental activity because that would exactly. sort of defeat the purpose of the calm mind. Um, but the, um, um, but, you know, like I said, I just, you know, like, like I said, kind of wondered if like, well, you know, have I, have I missed something here? You know, have I yes. grown some Yes. Just yeah. relax it. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. I get that uh, a lot. And part of that, what you're really expressing to me is your lack of confidence in, uh, in um, yourself to do the exercise. And uh, I think uh, once you gain some confidence about it, uh, that, sort of, that sort of questioning uh, sort of dissipates. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Hey there. I'm sorry, this is Stephanie. Uh, let me turn my camera back on real quick. Uh, I was just gonna ask along Lama Tom in line, uh, lines of what you were just saying. Uh, do you think that in that time of meditation, it's possible that you can kind of be guided in terms of what sort of insightful meditation you would you would need not need to but like kind of what you're being guided to do next like what kind of inspirational you know what new meditation you might want to I mean I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out myself because I feel like maybe there's a void that happens between when you have been able to stabilize and, and clear your mind a little bit, not all the way, but enough to where you're open to finding a new motivation in terms of bodhicitta, in terms of maybe a new ability to be open to bodhicitta and that how, how do you know then what you put that specific intent on in your motivational uh, meditation where it's more specific to uh, insight that you would have to gaining bodhicitta that maybe you would have after gaining some clarity that I, I guess I'm just curious can that happen maybe is that kind of like a, a next step like a stepping stone that perhaps to take the meditation to a, a, a higher level in terms of gaining some higher level motivation. Yeah, I think one of the things I'd say that your question points to very clearly is that you need a, uh, an experienced uh, meditator as a spiritual friend for you. Uh, because there, there, there are progressions 
And when the mind is very stable, then you are able to use that uh, faculty to clearly see <clears throat> into uh, your mind better. <clears throat> but you would need an experienced meditator to guide you through that because you make a lot of mistakes there. Uh, so I would say talk to Lama Kathy for one or Eric, or you're certainly welcome to talk to me offline about it. The other thing I would say to everybody is that we never get enough merit. <laughs> we can never accumulate enough merit that will allow us uh, to clearly see. So <clears throat> I would say the practice of virtue and those sorts of things are terribly important to our practice. It enhances our practice. So coincidental to uh, your growing in your ability uh, to stabilize your mind, coincidental to that has to be an intensification of your practice of virtue. But again, I would say talk to a, a, a really skillful meditator at this point. Lama Tom, Rachel had a question a few moments ago and we were just having a little technical issue. If she may oh, okay. ask you now, if she still would like to. Hi there. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it, uh, this has been a, man, this has been a really great workshop. Um, so I'm finding that, um, first of all, I have to say, um, in all of my years of practicing, or I should say trying to practice meditation, um, I've always heard about keeping my eyes open during meditation. And I don't know, for some reason, I've never been brave enough until today. So thank you for holding a space for me to feel brave enough to do that. And um, something really different happened. And I, I don't understand what it was, but it, I feel, I kind of feel affect, more affectionate towards my meditation practice now. I, I don't know exactly what the word is, but I'm kind of like, oh, I love, I love your meditation. I know that sounds silly, but you know, it's like just some, something, okay, bless. I like that word. I like that word. Um, but it's also raised So now I, I'm, I'm feeling fearful now, now that I've, I've been able to kind of analyze the, this feeling of what you call bliss. Now I'm feeling fearful and I am going to take your suggestion and find other meditators, other experienced meditators, but is there something I could do? I just feel like I don't want like, I don't want like a, like a meditation drop or anything like that to, to, to happen. So is, any suggestions for like the rest of the day? Sure. <laughs> what I say is, um, there, that, that feeling that you really feel good about this is great. Use that to establish the intention that you're going to meditate, that you're going to find uh, like-minded people. I would suggest, for example, going on the Wednesday uh, group that meets uh, with Eric Weinberg. So don't allow this good feeling just to dissipate, use it to establish an intention to do something with it. Great. Awesome. Well, we are, we are running over. One of the things that we always do uh, when we uh, complete our meditation is we dedicate that, the merit of this. So I'm going to say a traditional prayer of meditation, uh, uh, dedication. And I, I, I want to say again, I am so grateful for all of your practice. I am so grateful that you persevered to the end. And I, I, I wish you, as I said before, I can't promise you things get better. But I can promise you that if you work on your meditation, there will, be cut, there will come a time when there will be nothing that can overwhelm your stability and clarity of mind. And that's what I wish for all of you. So for, um, 
for our dedication. Through the blessing of the Buddha's attainment of the three bodies, through the blessing of the unchanging truth of the Dharmata, and through the blessing of the unwavering aspiration of the Sangha, the center, you could say. By this dedication prayer be accomplished. The courageous Manjushri who knows everything as it is, Samantabhadra who also knows in the same way, and all the Bodhisattvas that I may follow in their path. I completely dedicate all this virtue. By this merit, may we all attain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing. And from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the stormy, from the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By this virtue, may I quickly attain the state of Guru Buddha and then lead every being without exception to that very state. May precious and supreme bodhicitta, the heart and mind of enlightened enlightenment, which has not been generated now be so. And may precious bodhicitta, the heart and mind of awakening, of liberation, which has already been, may it never decline, but continuously increase. May the seeds of the virtuous action sown in this work flourish for all sentient beings. May all beings find genuine masters and completely attain enlightenment. May all the great religions of the world flourish for the benefit of all beings according to their temperaments. May this precious lineage of the Gawakamata and the Kajusitas remain until all beings are freed from this ocean of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Through the blessings of the Buddhas who attain the three kayas, the blessing of the unchanging truth of the Dharma, and the blessing of the, unlim uh, of the limitless aspirations of the Sangha, may these wishes be fulfilled. Thank you all very much. Uh, have a great week. And, uh, May your minds be stable and may they be clear. Love you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Lama Tom. Thank you.